Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our April Bite-Sized Rosen series, where we're spending three weeks looking at the topic of material selection. We hope that in today's session of Bite-Sized Corrosion, you will find that we make the corrosion challenges associated with material selection just a little more digestible. Now, last week, we looked at some key considerations that guide our choice of material. And one of Neil Webb's key points was that sometimes the costs and perhaps restricted use parameters may make the choice of what we might call an ideal material impractical and therefore less than ideal. So today we're going to explore some complex polymer materials which can be used, mostly not independently or standalone, but using say a mild steel structure as its support. So today I'm really delighted to welcome Donovan Slade to the microphone. Many of you will know Don. He has more than 30 years experience with polymeric systems and raw materials for these, especially polyurethanes and polyurethanes in all their forms as coatings, as adhesives, as sealants, and as elastomers. He's also been exposed to many construction chemicals and explored the uses in waterproofing systems and abrasive resistant liners and corrosion mitigation coatings in many environments. So I really think Don is going to be uh, a well worthwhile resource for us to tap into today. And I just want to congratulate Don. He's just recently completed his MBA and he's also just completed some of the AMP courses, the SSPCC1 and C2, to add to his collection of the CIP3, uh, which is the senior coatings, um, Inspector and PCS Advance. So Don, you've definitely got these um, organic substances down pat. So congratulations and welcome. It's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you, Vanessa. Thanks for having me. That's a pleasure. Now, Don, in our last bite-sized correction, Neil Webb and I were discussing, as I said, some key considerations for material selection. And whilst we obviously looked at mechanical strength, we also looked at the importance of considering the environment and the design life, and that from our perspective, corrosion resistance is critical. And in our discussion, we observed that steels aren't always suitable and that some sort of complex polymer might provide the corrosion resistance required. Now, I think let's just start right there. Complex polymer uh, starts to make me feel a little uneasy. Can you explain that in very simple terms, perhaps? I think the easiest way to explain it is it's a plastic. So okay. if you depends what you add into it, or what additives you're adding to it, and what fillers you're adding into that uh, complex polymer or plastic, what makes it perform and gives it its physical properties. Now, if you look at a polyurethane, which obviously I've been, as you stated, I've been involved in for 30 years, you would have a polyol and you would have an isocyanate. And in that polyol, you'll have various additives, be it uh, moisture absorbers, UV stabilizers, and then you'll also have an, an additive which gives you a hardness of your polymer. So with PUs, you're able to have the hardness from a triple naught, which is a very soft gel, to something that is an 85 shore D, which is as hard as uh, you know your skeleton bones and anything in between. So I think that probably sums up a complex polymer as best as I can put it. Thank you. I'd like to look in a little bit more detail at polyurethanes because that's obviously where your tremendous experience lies. Just as we start off, you mentioned that we're dealing with a monomer and an isocyanate, and I know that can raise the hackles of health people. The word cyanide in any form makes us a little bit scared. So can you put us at ease perhaps, I hope? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's it's an isocyanate, not cyanide. So it's not okay. cyanide, it's an isocyanate. But as any chemical that deserves the respect of who's using it and who's applying it. So my suggestion would be to use a double organic uh, paint mask when uh, operating with isocyanates and also wear, you know, gloves and PPE. I think all polymers and all chemicals, it doesn't matter what it is, you know, should be given the respect that it deserves. And if we're talking about that, when I'm looking at a polyurethane 
liner of a tank, for example, or the external of maybe a complex valve that has got a polyurethane on. I'm not dealing with that isocyanate at that level any longer, am I? That's been completely combined into the polymer. Yeah, when it's mixed in the correct ratio, then it's fully inert and fully reacted. So you won't have any free isocyanates typically. When you're spraying these polymers, you must give it a respect that it deserves and wear the, the PPE as best as possible. But when it's actually applied and it's cured and it's hard and it's got its physical properties, it won't have any free isocyanates anymore. Okay, so we can all breathe a sigh of relief. Thank you. Don, where could we use polyurethanes as we're looking now as a material of construction in those sorts of industries? Yeah, I think a good place is a tank. You know, the, the whole thing about polymers and polyurethanes is quite vast. So I think to be specific, if we could start in a tank. So if you're looking at a tank, you get different types of tanks. So you get a concrete tank, you get a mild steel tank, standard steel tank, and you also get a galvanized tank. And then you get different types of tanks, like a Braithwaite tank that has a lot of movement and so forth. And these tanks hold different medium. It might be an abrasive medium. It might be alkaline medium, could be an acid medium, or it could be a com combination of all three. So, or, or two, should I say. So depending on what the substrate is, is depending what system you would start to plan and, and start to use. So my suggestion would be do a site inspection, get, gather as much information as possible from the asset owner, uh, get the tank information, a lot of the time it's quite difficult to get that tank information, but get the information of what, what is actually going in the tank, what has been in the tank, what's the history of the tank, and what temperature does the tank uh, operate at. You know, temperature and acids in particular, and alkalines in particular, you add, you add temperature, it makes it more aggressive. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a concrete tank, you would need to use a primer, and the primer would be quite specific because you could have high moisture content of the concrete, so you'd have to use a moisture barrier, and a hydrophobic epoxy primer to dissipate uh, any moisture that may be there. And the PU would be brush applied or spray applied onto that. And then if you're looking at stainless steel or mild steel or galvanized tanks, we'd have various different primers that are suitable for that substrate to be applied. And then the PU would be brush applied or spray applied uh, over the specific primer. So what I'm hearing you say is that uh, when we would construct our vessel, we're actually looking at almost a three-layer system. We've got our steel, let's call that the first layer. Then we've got an adhesive in the middle. And then we've got the polyurethane, which will be in contact with our aggressive medium. Yeah. Polyurethane isn't a, a polymer for all applications. So it would really depend what acid is, is going in, into that tank. If it was an high sulfuric acid uh, application or a high temperature application, Possibly an, another chemistry would be more suitable, like a vinyl ester and, and so forth. But people like to use polyurethanes because they're quite easy to apply. You can apply them with single component airlesses, some of the formulations. Some of them take plural component and others take brush and, and roller applied. So my recommendation would be, as stated before, gather as much information as possible. Contact the manufacturers that uh, you're used to, to dealing with and speak to their labs and, and chemists and give them the information that you have and be as, as honest as, as possible. And uh, once uh, they have that information, they can specify the correct grade of, of PE to use. And then also make sure that you choose a contractor that uh, has a lot of experience in uh, applying uh, polyurethanes because it can be quite tricky, especially with plural component equipment. Some of these uh, deviations on formulation and spray only have a 3% deviation. So if you don't have an experienced uh, applicator, you know, you can have the best system and best design, but the applicator may not be, you know, educated in a way to use it. And then the whole contract is an ab absolute mess. Yeah, you don't want the equivalent of me baking a cake where it says a cup and I go, oh, this is about right. You actually need to be really accurate. Just chatting about, about the polyurethanes, and uh, you made a comment a little earlier about that there was movement in, in the tank. Polyurethanes, I tend to think of as sort of a, a firm structure, which then I would have expected to crack. So, so obviously there are formulations that can be used that give it a bit more flexibility. As I mentioned, uh, you can have any hardness from triple naught A all the way up to 85D and anything in between. Typically, if you've got an abrasion lining, it would be elastomeric, meaning that it's got elasticity, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, and it's able to equate for movement. Um, different formulations have higher abrasion indexes than others. 
If you got an alkaline tank or got a tank that's holding uh, various chemicals and so forth, they're typically quite hard. So, you know, I wouldn't apply a rigid system which which has uh, DFTs of two, three, four, five millimeters to a concrete substrate because the movement might cause the actual top coat to, to crack. So, yes, elastomeric systems are used for great amount of movement, being in Braithwaite tanks or concrete substrates. And then steel tanks, aluminium, stainless steel, or uh, galvanized tanks uh, with no movement, you know, you can go for the harder systems. And when I talk about hardness, you're typically looking at anything from about a 65 shore D up to an 85 shore D. The reason why we use the harder systems for chemical applications is because the permeation is a lot lower because these okay. systems typically have various amounts of fillers and so forth in them that gives them greater amount of chemical resistance. Is the amount of cross-linking in the polymer related directly to the uh, catalyst and the formulation? Does the cross-linking tie up as well with the uh, hardness or the rigidity of the product? Well, not to get too involved in the chemistry because I know we can get both of us can get carried away because it is our passion, Vanessa. But you've got if you've got a high functionality of a of a polymer with a medium equivalent weight, and you've got a product with a high NCO, you typically would have multiple multiple cross linking, and you have a multiple branch polymer. And with that, because it's multiple branch and not a, a linear segment, you would have a hard polymer that has a, a low permeation. But obviously, adding fillers and so forth would add to the lower permeation of the actual polymer. So when you talk about catalysts in polyurethane, we don't have an A and a B system. We talk about a polyol, and we talk about a cross-linker, and we talk about an isocyanate. A catalyst is something that you add in in drops to make the reaction go quicker. It's not a catalyst that you would add as your B component, component if that makes okay. uh, any sense. Yes, okay. You made a comment earlier about the possibility of water permeation through a concrete tank. And my knowledge of polyurethanes as spray fillers using moisture to cure them. I presume moisture can be a problem with some polyurethanes during the curing phase. Obviously, once it's cured, it's cured and it's not going to be a problem anymore. It depends on what the chemistry is because the chemistry is quite vast. So if you have a moisture curing urethane, you know, it, it wants water, not too much water, but it, it wants to attract water from, from the air and pull it in and actually cure. But if you're talking about a, a two-component system where you have an A and a B or a polyol and an isocyanate system, you don't want to incorporate water because if you incorporate water, it will start to foam. And then the aesthetics of your actual application will look terrible and also you wouldn't be getting the optimum physical properties. So what formulators typically do is they add additives into the polyol, which are water absorbers, so the molecular sieves. So if you have a water molecule, it encapsulates a water molecule, doesn't allow it to take place in the reaction. However, you can't be putting 30, 40, 50% of the water scavengers into your formulation because then you won't be able to use it. So it would only help in initial stages that if there's excess water, it will foam. Would you give us some examples? We've mentioned some cases where polyurethanes can be used. In fact, maybe you can give us some further examples of where polyurethanes can be used. In which sort of environments would it would they have good application? I think, uh, you know, the most common ones that we all understand is the aliphatic PUs, which are used for aesthetic purposes and to protect what's lying underneath it. And they, those would be the UV-stable aliphatic paint, thin film coating paint systems. Then the most common place in the piping industry are the rigid polyurethanes or the RPUs, which are direct-to-metal uh, applications. And those are sprayed by a plural component. But other more exotic applications that maybe some of your listeners might not be not be used to is you get doming resins you know those stickers with the decals and their clear coating on top of it that's actually a polyurethane mm -hmm. it's an aliphatic polyurethane with uh, uv stabilizers to make sure it doesn't yellow and, and so forth and that comes in flexible and non-flexible hard rigid grades and then if you're driving on the highway you'll see some of the pickup trucks or buckies like I call them in south africa the black coating on the back that's that is also a bucky lining or a or a polyurethane and then in the casting industry, when I say casting, you're actually not spraying the polymer, you're actually mixing and either hand casting or dispense casting it into various mining parts. And those mining parts would be scraper blades, flotation pots that can be uh, caster wheels, 
you know, that you would see on uh, forklift tires and, and, and so forth? Okay, so it's got a broad application and use around. So then I have to ask you, to be honest, and tell us where should we not use them? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, polyurethanes can be used in possibly most applications. And that's the reason is because is they're so easy to apply. As I mentioned earlier, they can either be brushed, uh, you know, or rolled or air displayed or pleural component spray. But they're not always the most suitable for those applications, even though they can be used. And uh, I would say if you start getting to the higher percentage of aggressive chemicals, I wouldn't use PUs. I would start looking at uh, the vinyl esters, uh, the phenolics and all that, those type of polymers. Um, also, when there's high temperature involved, especially if it's high temperature with an acid or an alkaline or so forth, that makes it more aggressive. So PUs typically... Uh, the standard ones that we use, which are the MDR types and the TDR types, you're looking at constant temperatures of between 65 and 100 degrees Celsius, depending on the formulation. Somebody might argue and say, yeah, but I've seen PUs that have heat deflections of 180 degrees Celsius. Yes, you do have those, but those raw materials are quite exotic. And they're used not typically in spray applications, but in casting applications. I mean, just you mentioned raw materials, and I'm always very cognizant that living at the bottom end of Africa, getting raw materials can be quite challenging. Are there any considerations we need to take into account when we're looking at materials as to where we source our either our polyurethane or our raw materials to make our polyurethane? Do we need to be cautious in any regard, thinking like Europe, America as suppliers? Well, typically, raw materials come from, from Asia and also Europe, not really North America as in the past. So China, Vietnam, Thailand, that type of Southeast Asia and China mainland have really started dominating on, on the raw materials with regards to polyurethanes. So my suggestion would be, and which has been commonplace in, in most systems houses or manufacturers of polyurethane systems in South Africa, is that they would source these raw materials and test them to stringent international standards. Then after testing them, they would obviously put them out into the field and make sure that they are able to you know, survive what they've been designed to survive against. So it, it wouldn't be just buying raw materials, putting them in a formulation, and the next week, you know, they've been used by a customer. It has to go through rigorous amount of testing and approval to quantify where possibly the shortcomings may be. And if they don't meet up to the specification that the raw material supplier or the, the converter or manufacturer has, then those would be discounted and not used. So testing is important and making sure that that those raw materials live up to the physical properties that have been promised on a technical data sheet. Allied to that question, I think, Don, do you find that formulations have to be changed to deal with South African conditions? Most definitely. I, I gave an example uh, previously to somebody, and that was Richards Bay. In their sand, uh, they have a particular uh, bug that, that eats polyester polyurethanes. And uh, in order to, to overcome that, certain additives have to be added to the elastomer to make sure that the bugs don't eat the elastomer. Because you know, if you use a polyester casting system, say a scraper blade or even a flotation part, and you put it into that application, it would take weeks and wouldn't be there. But if you use the right polyol, being a PDMG polyol with the right additive, then that wouldn't happen. It would last, you know, hopefully for, for months. Mm -hmm. So that would be more in the slurry applications uh, like your, your pipeline, slurry liners and flotation parts. Great. And I'm also sure that anything exposed to the sun in this country needs to have been tested that it can withstand the, the sun here because it does seem to be quite harsher. Yeah, then it comes to cost because you do have aliphatic polyurethane coatings and you also have aliphatic polyurethane uh, elastomers. But, you know, aromatics, which are the non-UV stable grades, are typically used because of the costs are much, much less than the aliphatic grades. If you're looking at coatings, you can overcome the UV by specialized additives, be it your pigment, be it your UV stabilizers, which will last for a couple of months, or it would be the fillers that you use would help it. But your binder is non-UV stable, so that will start to chalk. The polyaspartic is designed for UV resistance and it would be more suitable for the application. In the aliphatic range, just to explain, in the past, you only had aliphatic PUs. Now you have polyaspartic PUs, 
which are actually a lot better than a, the aliphatic grades uh, in with regards to UV resistance. So if anybody's listening and you want to know what to look at for PUs, besides uh, aliphatic PUs, look at polyaspartics. We'll put that one into our vocabulary list. Thank you. Yeah, Don, I think this has been a really interesting discussion. I'm learning so much and thinking, wow, lots of uses and also lots of cautions about uses. And would it be worth, when you are looking at a new, perhaps, application of a polyurethane to run testing to make sure that the uh, combination of the steel structure and the polyurethane that we think is going to do the trick, that it's suitable for the course? Are there sort of routine tests one can do? Well, you, you never know that the information that you receive about a tank or a pipeline is 100% correct. So I would suggest that coupons are coated like you would want to coat to the finished item and test it over a couple of months and see how it performs. You know, you, you could be dealing with millions of dollars or millions of rands, so it would be most, you know, advisable to do that. And then also ask the, the supplier, the manufacturer, to give you test data. You know, they have Atlas cells, and in Atlas cells, they put different medium of chemicals exposed to oxygen and uh, fully submersed. They can give you that information if it's resistant to it and get a relationship with the manufacturer, in particular, the laboratory of the manufacturer, and uh, you know specify the correct material for, for application and do extensive testing. Right. Basically, do your homework as you would for the yeah. choice of any material. Just looking at other options. So you mentioned earlier that polyurethanes, although you love them, are not necessarily the answer to every application. Let's just brainstorm a couple of other options that we could possibly use as a, say, a tank liner uh, in our applications. Well, we did mention vinyl esters. You know, mm -hmm. vinyl esters have excellent uh, chemical resistance, especially on the higher percentages. You can look at uh, the phenolics and the Novolac epoxy is also excellent with regards to chemical resistance. Where PUs come into it is if you've got an abrasion medium plus you've got the chemical problem to overcome uh, inside a tank, then you know possibly the, the PU would be a better option. You can also have a duplex coating or triplex coating where you have your abrasion liner being the polyurethane, and underneath it you have your Novolac, and underneath that you have your epoxy primer. You can put some sort of a combination together that can overcome most of your, your challenges. Right. And then, of course, there's still glass, there's rubber. I mean, those are other options that, that would be available. To... And PUs can bond to glass. If you've got the correct primer, if you've got the correct silane and the correct primer, you can bond to, to glass quite successfully. Your contractor would have to be very experienced yes. because especially with the polyurea technologies, you have a lot of shrinkage and you could potentially crack your glass. So it comes down to application. Right. Gosh, Don, I think you've given us a lot of food for thought. Thank you probably asked more questions than answered, but I really do appreciate your joining us today and helping us to understand some of the complex polymers. And I'm sure our audience will agree that this has been really informative and educational. So thank you very much.